Good morning, Your Honors, and if it pleases the court, my name is Celia Cangelosi, and together with my co-counsel, Carrie Jones, we represented um, the Louisiana Secretary of State in this case. The case was brought against the Louisiana Secretary of State and two other state agencies under the National Voter Registration Act. The case was tried in the Eastern District Court and resulted in the issuance of both a declaratory judgment and a permanent injunction by the District Court. The Secretary of State has appealed to this court seeking a review of the rulings below of the District Court. We're asking the court to reverse the District Court judgments, both on summary judgment and following trial, and to dismiss the claims of both of the plaintiffs. Now, the other two state defendants, I forgot who they were now, um, the Department of Family Services, is that it? The Department of Children and Family Services, their secretary was sued, and also uh, the secretary of the Department of Health and Hospitals. All right. And ne neither appealed. All right. Just sort of theoretically. Uh, they didn't appeal. So assuming, for, well, assuming you got relief in part of whole, part of the secretary, I'm somewhat, I don't have it clearly in my head, the division of kind of responsibilities vis-a-vis Chedler, those officers, et cetera. So with them not appealing, you know, what would be the the upshot of if you win, so to speak? And I don't mean to take you away from your main argument. It's just when I read that with these other two not in the case and, and there being these injunctions, can you just help me for a moment? What, what would be the upshot? Okay. What would be the practical effect yeah. of it all? The um, – the, 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 the district court opines about a, a lot of things under Section 7 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 7 covers public assistance agencies' uh, duties and disability services offices' duties. These two defendants in this case involved only the public assistance agency duties. So she made a ruling with respect to disability offices, too, even though that wasn't before the court. So. Yeah, probably those two agencies are stuck with following her ruling if this court would reverse. But there's other things under Section 7, such as disability offices, that wouldn't be forced with following that ruling. Um, and, and, and no court has ever spoken on Section 7 of the Voting Rights Act, so I think no appellate court um, in this area, so I think it would be beneficial. But that's Okay, well, yeah, and I didn't mean to take you away from your main argument to get there, but it's just I don't want to forget to ask because in the back of my mind it's the nature of if these three parts of state have duties here and if two people, two entities are bound to act and then if the secretary weren't, what the interplay in terms of negating. But that's just the question I have. But go ahead with your main and, argument. I mean, you have some time, but it's just. And, and another part too, Your Honor. Because what standing? Huh? Excuse what standing me? Does, your, does your client have to raise these other issues? Because we were sued, um, we were sued under the Voting Rights Act, and, and they, I mean the, the NVRA, and the court held us responsible for, the court said, Secretary of State, you're responsible for violations by these other agencies. But what if we find that he is not responsible? Then that uh, ends the case. As to the secretary, the appeal, huh? but what happens to the? Uh, we don't rule on anything else other than the fact that he is uh, not responsible. If he's not responsible, then he's you know not the judgment against him is reversed, and as you know the attorney's fees award against him is reversed. Um, the other agencies I, would I assume be bound by the ruling because they didn't appeal it, but disability and officers. They're not represented. You're not pretending to represent them. No, sir, I'm not. Okay. And they had separate counsel at trial and made their own separate decision not to appeal. And the, the Secretary of State. The issue before us is the, uh, the, whether the Secretary of State is a proper defendant in this case. Well, he's a proper defendant, I, perhaps, but w whether what his, what his duties were as to coordination of responsibilities. And I think there's two other issues, uh, Judge, that are the primary issues as well. And one is jurisdiction whether these particular plaintiffs had standing to raise these issues at all and, you know, and invoke the federal court jurisdiction. 
Also, uh, the other question is whether the National Voter Registration Act applies to only in-person transactions and not to so-called remote transactions as the district court held. And then the third issue is what are the limits of the Secretary of State's responsibility, we think, under the Act? So is he responsible for violations of the Act by other entities? So we think those three issues are, are the important issues. But are you saying, Judge, you think that it's only the, the responsibility of the Secretary of State? If, he, if we rule in his favor, I mean, if we rule that he is a proper defendant, then we reach these other issues. Okay. Well, let me address that issue first. Under the National Voter Registration Act, the Secretary of State is responsible well, the National Voter Registration Act says each state shall designate a chief election official, and the chief election official be, shall be responsible for the coordination of responsibilities under the Act. Coordination of responsibilities. And what the court held was, you're responsible for coordination, but we, but I, the court, think that that includes uh, you have to enforce it, you have to ensure the enforcement, and if any other, anybody else violates the act, such as DHH or DCFS, then I'm going to hold you, the Secretary of State, responsible, because you're supposed to ensure compliance. That's what she held. And our argument there is, no, 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 it's coordination of responsibilities. And we tried to show what we did to coordinate responsibilities, and we were somewhat um, unable to show it what, what had been done by the Secretary of State and its predecessor for the earlier years since the, in the beginning of the Act, because the Court said, I'm only going to let you show what you did in 2010, which you did recently. So we couldn't show what was done early, but we could just show what we were doing now. And what we do is that we develop, uh, we offer training, we develop a manual that tells them what to do, we do PowerPoint presentations, um, we do other things under the National Voter Registration Act, but we're not required to ensure compliance with other agencies. And what tells you it's not our requirement is the Act itself, because if you look in Section 8 of the Act, in Section 8 of the Act is the part where it says um, the maintenance of records portion, and it says the state is supposed to ensure that people are registered to vote if they register at an agency and they're supposed to, in their application gets there, you have to ensure that they're registered within so many days. So when the court, when the uh, legislature, the Congress wanted us to ensure, it said the word ensure. And so when it said the word coordinate, it didn't mean for us to ensure, it meant for us to coordinate responsibilities. And we think the evidence shows that we did that. And we, we don't think the evidence shows that there's any standing by those particular plaintiffs against uh, the Secretary of State. What are the important elements of standing? Injury in fact and traceable to the actions of the defendant. Are those traceable to the actions of the Secretary of State? Um, the plaintiffs have the burden of proof on those uh, standing. This court looks at it de novo. Let's look at the individual plaintiff, Luther Scott. What injuries does he complain of? He complains of things that happened on three dates, September 1, December 1, and that's in 2010, and then November 15, 2010. Before you get into that, and I'm sorry to keep interrupting you. But, yes, sir. Uh, before you get into that, why didn't these other defendants, judgment was against these other defendants as well, mm -hmm. but they just chose not to? Appeal? Judge, that's a, that's a question that, that I don't know the answer to. I, our office did appeal. Our office would have assumed they should have. Who represented have, them? They were represented by separate counsel. Um, by private counsel or by public counsel? By both. They originally had public counsel, and then prior to trial, they retained private counsel. Um, and I don't know why they didn't appeal, and that wouldn't have been if they would have asked me, but of course I, I can only represent one client and not the other one. Um, when you look at Mr. Scott, he says, I went into a food stamp office, and food stamp offices are uh, under the direction of the Department of Children and Family Services on September 1, and nobody discussed voter registration with me. Not at all. Um, the, uh, the lady testified from the food stamp office, and, she, and we had the records, and he had signed the declaration form 
um, without checking either box as to whether he wanted to register a vote or not. But he said, nobody told me that was about voter registration. I don't know anything about voter registration. It wasn't discussed with me at all. The lady at the food stamp office, Ms. Banks, said, yes, I did discuss it with him. I discussed it with everybody. It's part of my routine, my habit, my practice. I, dis I tell them they have voter registration. And look at my notes from that day when I met. It says discussed voter registration. But Mr. Scott said, nobody talked to me about any at all. Let's assume Mr. Scott's right and nobody talked to him about voter registration at all. Number one, I got two things to talk about there. Does he have an injury in fact, number one, and I'll, we'll talk about that. And is the injury traceable to the Secretary of State? Does he have an injury in fact? We submit he doesn't because Mr. Scott was registered to vote in Arlene's parish. He was registered to vote at that time. He could vote. He never tried to vote. He never voted, but he was registered. And our Commissioner of Elections, Angie Rogers, testified. Here's the records from that we maintain of registration. He had been registered and able to vote since June of 2008. But there's nothing in, in the cases or anything that I saw that pins compliance here with whether, in fact, the person is registered to vote at that time. And I guess as to his claim, uh, I hadn't read the whole record by any stretch, just snippets of it, but it appears it's just that he was mobile, to, to put it mildly. I mean, he moved around, et cetera, et cetera. And it seemed at least in part the statute is driven by, you know, people who changed their registration, et cetera. So uh, you argued in the brief and you argued strongly here about mm -hmm. the, well, he, the injury has got to be tied to, in other words, is to say definitionally if he's registered to vote somewhere, it's an impossibility based on the statute to show the harm, but I haven't seen that in any of the cases that, that, that you cite. I understand your argument. I just haven't seen uh, that anywhere that that's the requirement on the standing. Well, there are some or cases. Or to show the traceable injury. Yeah, we cited them, Your Honor. We cited some cases, um, you know, it's a, a, Dabrowski was one of them, uh, Creaslow versus Redor. We cited them in our brief, and it says you have to show that your right to vote was impaired. But what we specifically showed is that under Louisiana law, it didn't matter if he moved within the parish. Under Louisiana law, he could still vote as long as he remained living in, in Arlene's parish, and the evidence is that he did, he could still vote in federal elections. And the, the right to vote in federal elections is what's protected by the National Voter Registration Act. So we think he didn't have any injury to him because he wasn't offered the opportunity, as he claims, to register that he had no injury in fact. Well, like I said, I understand that's your argument. It just, I mean, it's not a bad argument. It says, I don't Can't see that you. in the statute itself that that's the requirement. But go to, I guess, the sub part of what you're you know, assuming that to be the case. You're arguing that even if that's true, it's not traceable to uh, Secretary Shedler. And so, Finish up that part. In evidence is um, SOS uh, 25 is the manual that the Secretary of State provides to these different agencies, and it says you were supposed to offer the opportunity to register to vote to these people with each application. So if they didn't, they violate the Secretary of State rules, and we certainly can't be responsible for anybody violating our rules. So you would say the manual that was introduced in the evidence and testified about refutes the district court's determination on that point. Is that what you're Well she held us she held us we had to ensure we didn't ensure and, and my point is we instructed them to do it. We coordinated responsibilities and in that regard um, in that regard you know we we discharged our duty and if they fail you to follow our instructions or fail you to, to do what we say is to coordinate that's not our um, bad. That's not my fault and I'm not responsible for that. I, I'm just concerned because I have 43 seconds left, and I think one of the main issues. Madam will, Clerk, I'm, I'm going I'm I'm yeah. to add or give add three minutes to to that side. 
uh, to finish. And if I need to equalize on the other side, we will. Got a lot going on. All right, you got some more time. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate did, it. Did, did, Mr. Did Mr. Scott also fail to give the required statutory notice? Did yes, you Your Honor. That's another thing, Your Honor, too. Neither Mr. Scott nor the NAACP, uh, who state conference gave the required statutory notice was a prerequisite to suit under the NVRA because the remedy under the NVRA is is related to the notice. You have to give a remedy as whatever, you have to tell us what your violation is, give us 90 days to cure. If we don't cure it, then you're going to get a remedy only on that violation. We don't even know what Mr. Scott claimed originally was his violation and neither the state conference gave, provided the notice in the trial as an element of proof. Also, um, the, we don't think the NAACP state conference proved it standing either. They didn't show any voter registration activity during 2010 um, that they had done, and certainly nothing that was linked to a violation by the Secretary of State. What they show is one man stood outside of a food stamp, uh, outside of a building that houses a food stamp office and a building that houses WIC and um, registered people. It doesn't show who the people were. Had they come from the WIC office? Had they come from the food stamp office? Were they supposed to have been given the opportunity to vote? I, I don't know that. Did they go in there for a flu shot? Did they drive a friend? So there's no showing that ties that together. But the biggest issue in this case is, is I think, is the case of in-person versus remote. Whether does that statute apply to only in-person applications? And the statute says it only applies to in-person applications. And Justice, to Section 7, and Justice Scalia said that in a case, uh, you know, an Arizona Tribal Council case in 2013, he says the NVRA allows methods for voter registration in three ways. Number one, simultaneously with a driver's license application. Number two, by mail. And number three, in person at certain offices. So it's only in person. What the court did was take one section out of context, read it alone, and let it control everything else. We've cited in our brief all the reasons why we think it doesn't apply, all the things that would be that would be made absurd, the other provisions, if you take that one section in isolation and try to apply it, um, you know, to in person, because there's all kind of other protections built in the statute. And we cited four instances of that, and they are all for in person only. So if it applies to remote, they don't get protections of the statute. That's our, um, the, uh, we think was the big issue in the case was the in person versus remote application. We never get to that if we don't have to say, if the parties don't have standing. That's correct, Your Honor. Um, so I, I'm kind of I, I didn't use my time wisely, but it, before, before I run out, do there any questions or anything I could address that the court's interested in? No, you've reserved some time for rebuttal. So if there, you know, other issues obviously raised by the other side, you have time on rebuttal to. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate right. it. Thank you. All right, who's up first? Miss is up. I'm, I'm afraid I'll botch your name. No, that's okay, Your Honor. Or I'm Na Natasha Kurgonker. Kurgonker, okay. Yes, and I'd like to give our extra three minutes to my co counsel, Miss Brannon. All right. Okay. Good morning, and may it please the court. I'm Natasha Kurgonker, and along with my co-counsel, Sarah Brannon, I represent plaintiff appellees Mr. Luther Scott, Jr. and the Louisiana State Conference of the NAACP. I will be addressing the two issues of Section 7 statutory interpretation this morning, and Ms. Brannon will be addressing standing and the remaining issues. The NVRA is about giving effect to Congress's decision to make voter registration as widely and easily available as possible for all citizens generally. Section 7 of the NVRA is about realizing that goal for poor citizens specifically. The district court recognized these statutory goals and also the defendant's departures from the mandates of Section 7. First, the district court properly held that Section 7 applies to all benefits transactions regardless of how those transactions are conducted. At trial, the Louisiana Department of Health and Hospitals, DHH, a non-appealing defendant, stipulated that 88% of Medicaid applications in Louisiana are made via remote means, mostly through the postal mail. At trial, the other non-appealing defendant, the Louisiana Department of Children and Family Services, stipulated that over 50% of the benefits that they provided in 2011 
or provided via remote means. What a provision of the statute, provision or provision, subsections, whatever, do you point to that specifically show that remote transactions are included? Your Honor, we point to Section 7A6A, which is the distribution requirement. That requirement states that each application for benefits or each recertification, renewal, or change of address triggers the distribution requirement. That is to say that each application triggers the requirement that a public assistance agency, such as either of the non-appealing defendants, distribute a voter registration application along with the benefits application or the change of address form, whatever it may be. Congress specifically used broad language when it wrote Section 7 and used that language each in order to convey breadth upon, to confer rather, breadth upon the statute. It's far-reaching and there's no carve-out in it, as the Secretary of State suggests. DCFS also stipulated at trial that they're expanding the availability of remote transactions to their clients and that they expect it to grow. So a ruling that would exclude remote transactions would essentially mean that the majority of public assistance clients in Louisiana would not be given the opportunity to register to vote that's provided in Section 7 of the NVRA. The plain text of Section 7A7, as Your Honor inquired about, states that each application triggers the distribution requirement. The statute doesn't define each in any specific way, so this Court should give it the ordinary meaning that it has, and each means every. The Secretary of State hasn't provided any alternate definition of its own, and this Court's precedent in the PV case states that statutory construction must begin with the language employed by Congress and the assumption that the ordinary meaning of that language accurately expresses the legislative purpose. We think that the district court from the Kemp case in Georgia's reasoning is helpful today. As that court determined, there's no clear textual basis in any part of Section 7 or any part of the NVRA to limit the plain language meaning of the word each, and I believe that the judicial inquiry could be complete right there. However, the Secretary of State, unable to argue that... Doesn't Section 4 of 1733, doesn't it provide that it refers back to Section 6, distribution of mail, voter application forms in accordance with Paragraph 6, and then if you look to Paragraph 6, it says a voter registration agency is developed to provide service or assistance in addition to... will distribute with each application for such service or assistance and with each recertification. Doesn't that indicate that it means the agency at the office? Your Honor, this court doesn't need and should not import the in-person language from Section 4 into Section 7. That in-person language that Your Honor refers to is only limited, it's only found in Section 4, and it doesn't reappear anywhere in Section 7. Section 4 and Section 7 do different things but can be read together harmoniously. Section 4 establishes three baseline channels through which all states must accept voter registration from citizens, one of which is in person at a Section 7 agency. Now that's about citizens in general. Section 7 establishes what voter registration agencies are and also establishes that certain mandatory agencies must be named by the state, two of whom in Louisiana are the Department of Health and Hospitals and DCFS, the non-appealing defendants. There's a separate set of obligations upon those mandatory voter registration agencies, the ones that provide public assistance. That's found in Section 7A6, and that is the only part of any section in this whole statute that speaks very specifically to how public assistance agencies are to provide voter registration to their own clients specifically. Well, then let's look at 7A6Bi, which prescribes the following question to be asked. If you are not registered to vote where you live now, would you like to apply here today? That obviously refers to an in-person registration, not to something that's happening remotely. Well, first of all, Your Honor, that is an admonition, I believe, that goes to the client and isn't a mandate upon the agency. 
And well, second, it indicates, uh, excuse me, I don't mean to cut you off and certainly want to give you a chance to answer, but I mean, it certainly indicates, I mean, Congress put those, put those words in there referring to register to vote here today. In, indeed it did. It put those words in not the mandate that goes to the agency, but instead the admonition to the client, um, first of all. And, and second, I, I would respectfully disagree that that language here today necessarily connotes an in-person transaction. Again, it's simply part of the admonition that goes to the client, and nothing in that admonition would undermine the reach that is included in the mandate, in the each application trigger, that is indeed the mandate to the agency itself. Um, furthermore, uh, to speak to, to the question about the in-person language found elsewhere, um, under this court's precedent in the Wagoner case, when Congress includes language in one part of a statute and doesn't include it in another, and here I would say that we would consider the in-person language from four to be that language in this case, the court interprets that inclusion in one portion and exclusion in another to have been made purposefully and intentionally by Congress, and I think that that bears some consideration um, today. I also would point this court's attention to the principle that the specific governs the general. And what that means in this case is that there is only one part, as I mentioned earlier, of the entire statute that speaks to public assistance agencies and how they are to conduct transactions with respect to their own clients. And nothing in that portion of the statute has any in-person language whatsoever. I indeed, to the contrary, Congress said that it was each application, not certain applications, not some applications, or not in-person applications, but each that would trigger the distribution requirement. And I think that that is the most important language with respect to this question. And this reading of the statute is supported by the congressional intent and as well by the practical effects of the court's ruling. Um, this, the congressional intent, both as expressed in the legislative history that we have cited to in the brief, as well as the statutory goal found in section two makes it clear that this statute is intended to make it easy and to cast a wide net when it comes to voter registration for citizens and for poor citizens when it comes to Section 7. And as I mentioned before, the practical effects of this court's decision will be far-reaching. 88% of Medicaid applications are made remotely. The majority of SNAP applications in Louisiana are made remotely. So to exclude or to somehow find a carve-out for transactions that are made, made via remote means would have the absurd result of making it such that the vast majority of public assistance recipients in this state would be excluded from the benefits of Section 7, and that cannot be an intent that Congress wished for, and it is certainly not supported by the plain language of the text. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. 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 Brennan. May it please the Court. My name is Sarah Brannon. Both the plaintiffs in this case have standing, and the Secretary of State is responsible because the plaintiff's injuries are traceable to the Secretary's failure to properly coordinate the NVRA compliance by public assistance agencies in Louisiana. In this record, uh, is there any indication that uh, either plaintiff uh, attempted any kind of, of uh, remote uh, access activity? Uh, Your Honor, um, the plaintiff, Luther Scott, did not attempt any remote uh, activity, but the injury to the Louisiana NAACP is a diversion of resources. The Louisiana NAACP uh, conducted voter registration aimed at low-income African Americans in the state of Louisiana. All right. Well, so, so, so Scott has no standing as to remote access. Yes, Your Honor. His transactions were all in person. Um, but the Louisiana... But, but there's no show, I mean, again, I, I don't mean to cut you off, give you plenty of chance to answer, but, I mean, uh, as, as, as to the NAACP uh, plaintiff, th th there's, there's, there was no one who specifically tried a, a remote transaction. Is that, is that right? Or? Uh, well, Your Honor, the Louisiana NAACP's standing in this case is based on a diversion of resources, so it's not an attempt of a member of the Louisiana NAACP to register to vote. It's that the Louisiana NAACP, this is a standard established by this court in Acorn v. Fowler, expended resources registering public assistance clients and registering low-income individuals in the state of Louisiana. If the Secretary of State were properly coordinating 
uh, the MVRA compliance, including by giving proper advice to, uh, regarding remote transactions, then more low-income African Americans in the state of Louisiana would have been registered to vote through public assistance programs because every individual would have been offered voter registration from a public assistance agency, including through remote transactions. But and do you have any uh, real injury to the NAACP in this case with respect to the remote, remote uh, beneficiaries of these services? Uh, yes, Your Honor. If the uh, I mean, but that's hypothetical, though, is it? In other words, if you had mailed a if you had mailed a uh, declaration form to them, uh, then uh, somewhere along the line, they you would not have to expend your resources to reach those particular individual people. But there's no indication that in this case that there was ever an effort to or even a, a, the subject of the uh, complaint, really. I mean. Well, uh, Your Honor, um, the, there is uh, substantial evidence in the record, and the district court made a finding of fact that the Louisiana NAACP engaged in extensive activities to register low-income uh, individuals. Does that mean they can challenge uh, that in this case, they can reach out and challenge every uh, obstacle that they consider to be uh, to, to impair the African American vote. Uh, Your Honor, uh, the the challenge here is just for limited to voter registration. So the issue is the voter registration activities of the Louisiana NAACP aimed. It's also broad, though. I mean, to to say that you're attacking one specific statute on this broad. And how do we know? I mean, that is there any evidence of what percentage of these uh, recipients were African Americans, or what percentage were whites, or whether they were all one or the other? I mean, where, where's the evidence that you indeed? The the, the district court made a finding of fact that if the uh, voter registration services being offered by public assistance agencies in Louisiana complied with the NVRA, that more low-income African Americans would have already been registered to vote. Well, on what evidence did, the, did she find that? Uh, it, she made a, the district court made a reasonable inference. It's similar to the inference, inference that- Inference on what? In other words, uh, an inference has to come from something besides thin air. Uh, well, the inference is based on testimony that was presented at trial from the Louisiana NAACP that their experience and research uh, concluded that low-income African Americans in the state of Louisiana were less likely to be registered to vote. And the district court made an inference that that population was served by the public assistance agencies in the state of Louisiana and that if NVRA compliant voter registration services, including remote transactions, were offered to those individuals, that more of them would have been registered to vote, that the Louisiana NAACP would have found in this experience that low-income African Americans were registered to vote, and they could have diverted their resources to other forms of civic engagement, such okay. as uh, getting out the vote there or- was no, There was no evidence, if I understand it, that they were diverting any register in this particular class of voter, that is, the remote recipient of these benefits. Well, the evidence is that they were uh, diver diverting resources to register low-income individuals. I mean, there's evidence that they conducted voter registration drives in census tracts with very high unemployment rates. There's evidence that they conducted voter registration drives at churches in very low-income neighborhoods. But there's no evidence that they were denied that, denied that right by the motor voter registration it's not an issue of being denied the right to conduct voter registration. It's issue. It's an issue of having to divert their meager resources to doing voter registration at that population. This court found in Acorn v. Fowler uh, that the plaintiff in that. How would it have diverted? In other words, I, I don't understand. If unless they were making a specific effort to enroll uh, the remote recipients of this benefit, I don't see how they were diverted. Their, their activities would have been the same. Now, they may have signed up fewer people, but how, how would their, their... Well, no, Your Honor, the testimony from Reverend Taylor in the record is that if he had found individuals to be registered to vote, he would have conducted voter registration aimed at other populations, not the low-income community. 
So the diversion is not in whether they did voter registration or not. It's that they, they were required to focus their voter registration on one population over another. And in Acorn v. Fowler, this court found that that was a sufficient diversion of resources to confer what standing. What is the evidence that they were even uh, conducting a, a voter registration with respect to these people or had ever done it with uh, respect to low-income people? I, I see my time is up. May I answer your question, Your Honor? Yes. Um, Chief Judge. Yes. Yeah, so the, the evidence of which there's a, a, a significant amount in the court, in the the record in this case and that the district court found to be persuasive is that they did extensive voter registration aimed at low income populations. And the inference is that that population. When did they do that? In 2010, they did voter registration uh, uh, by going door to door. There's testimony. Low income people? And low income people. There's testimony in the record that they did canvas voter registration activities at census, in census tract areas with very high unemployment. And your contention is that if they had provided these destination forms, there would have been fewer doors to knock on. You'd have to knock on it to find out if they were registered. Um, and then they would come and say, well, I registered through um, Motor Voter or whatever it is. And um, I, mean, I just don't see that, it, that you put enough evidence on them. So, so and it's very vague and hypothetical. Uh, so, uh, Your Honor, our contention is that if low-income individuals in Louisiana were registered through public assistance programs that were offering the NVRA-required voter registration services, including through remote transactions, and as my... How does that fit in with standing under Article Three that it can't be abstract, that it must be a concrete? Because it seems to me you're arguing abstraction. I am arguing an inference, Your Honor. The, the evidence is clear that the Louisiana NAACP conducted voter registration in 2010 in low-income neighborhoods. And the evidence is clear from the testimony of Reverend Taylor that if they had found individuals to already be registered to vote, that they would have uh, aimed their voter registration <laughs> activities at different populations. They have very meager resources. They perhaps would have done less voter registration and instead done civic engagement work like getting out the vote. Uh, so it's, an, it's a diversion of resources from one area to another, which is exactly what this court found in Fowler was sufficient to give rise to standing to an organization. Um, I see my time is up, Your Honor. Uh, right, we before, would ask. Before you leave the podium, Council Officer, raised the issue of the notice issue with respect to Mr. Scott. So you need to address that before you leave the podium. Sure, Your Honor. Um, yes, uh, there was a notice letter sent in this case. The Louisiana NAACP sent a notice letter. It's in the record attached to the complaint. Um, the district court uh, found that that notice letter was sufficient and complied with the statutory prerequisite for both Mr. Scott and the Louisiana NAACP. For the holding by the Sixth Circuit in Acorn v. Miller, uh, it is not necessary to send duplicative notice letters. So any notice letter Mr. Scott would have sent in this case would have been duplicative of the notice letter that the Louisiana NAACP sent. The Louisiana NAACP's notice letter made a number of, uh, described a number of NBRA violations, including the failure to offer a voter declaration question during each and every covered transaction. In this case, Mr. Scott did not receive a voter declaration question when he reported a change of address to DCFS in November of 2010. The secretary and the other defendants in this case were on notice that public assistance agencies were not offering declaration questions during each and every covered transaction. They chose not to correct it. So under the holding of Acorn v. Miller, um, a, a notice letter from Mr. Scott would have been duplicative and is therefore unnecessary. All right. All right, thank you. thank you very much. We would ask that this court affirm the district court's ruling as to all issues. All right, back to you, Ms. Cangelosi. You have, oh, I'm sorry, I've got uh, amicus. I didn't mean to cut you off, my, my fault. Ms. Anderson. Yes, Your Honor, from the department. Anderson, okay, I apologize, I didn't mean to over, overlook you. <laughs> thank you, Your Honor. We appreciate you accommodating us. And as amicus, the United States addressed only the issues of the statutory interpretation for the MVRA. Congress used very broad and inclusive language when it drafted Section 7 of the NVRA and said that the state shall distribute with each application for such service or assistance and with each recertification, renewal, or change of address form, the mail-in voter registration application. And defendants in this case would have us turn to a number of statements and words from other sections of the statute 
and ask this court to draw a fairly broad conclusion that the MVRA doesn't apply to any remote transactions, despite this very broad language. Actually, that's not true. In his reply brief, the Secretary, his reply brief, the Secretary of State referred to the one that I referred to earlier, 7A6B little i, which says, would you like to apply here today? I mean, if you're relying on Section 7, you have to deal squarely with that language. There's no way that that language can be read to apply to a remote transaction, because it talks about to apply here today to register to vote. I think the important thing about that language is that it is an instruction to the applicant. It's put in the statute so that it can go on the form and be an instruction to the applicant. It's not the part of the statute that most directly addresses the state's duties and the consequences that the state has when it gets one of these qualified transactions. The principle of statutory interpretation. Well, but it completely undermines the argument that you just began with, which is that the state is somehow trying to divert our attention to other sections. They direct our attention specifically to this subsection, which it seems to me is very damaging to your position. I admit, Your Honor, that there are other parts of Section 7 that create some of these problems, but there are principles of statutory interpretation that we turn to when we see what appears to be a conflict within a statute. We want to look at the provisions that most directly address the duties at issue, and in that case, this is Section 7A6A. Is there any evidence as to what percentage of the applicants appear in person as opposed to remote contact as an applicant? As an applicant, I'm not aware of those figures, but again, we're here to talk about the statutory interpretation, so I think questions about what the state's procedures are are best directed to the state. Certainly, Your Honor, I'm afraid we don't take a position on the issues of standing and whatnot, but I would like to point out one other question. Well, somebody in the case is. I'm sorry? Somebody in the case is. You can't hide, you know, behind the corner. Well, certainly, we want that if you reach, we realize there may be ways that you don't reach these issues of statutory interpretation. We're just saying that if you do reach these issues, we'd like to clarify the United States' position on this, and if you are to adopt the defendant's view on these other parts of Section 7 and other words in the statute that make references to here and there, as the defendant points out, that leads to absurd results where people aren't covered by confidentiality protections, protections from undue influence, but what defendants don't point out is that those problems still exist under defendant's interpretation. They're saying that they're not required to send out these forms with voter, with these voter registration applications with certain transactions, but certainly states do, and there's nothing to stop states from putting these forms online with their benefits applications. Now, your argument is that the statute does not require this, but agencies do do it, so everybody should be made to do it? No, Your Honor. Our argument is that, that I was making is that as long as these things are online, it's really an absurd result to think that those, that these are not covered, whether states do them voluntarily or are required to do them, are not covered by the confidentiality provisions. What you have here is a federal imposed mandate on state agencies. Certainly, Your Honor. That's the basic principles. And it's uncompensated. No additional funds were promoted to pay for the states to do this service for the federal government, the federal elections, and they may well have said, you know, there's just a certain amount of burdens that we can apply, put on the state to do the federal government's work, and that's why they refer to it as in person and don't require the state to be the agent of the NAACP or any other group that's trying to get people to vote. I see my time is up, but if I could, nearly up, but if I could adjust your question. Congress in Section 7A6 tied that requirement to the transaction, and all that 7A6 requires is a distribution of these forms. I think it reflects the structure of the act that Congress wanted states to use the provisions that they already had, procedures that they already had for benefits applicants, and just make sure that those applicants have a chance at voter registration, too. Section 7 requires a distribution of forms. It only requires the degree of assistance that the store already provides for benefits applications. With respect to Section 4, that section says that states do have to make available some in-person opportunity to register to vote, but it's not written as a restriction. It doesn't mean that 
every other part of Section 7 has to be constrained to in-person applications. And we can see the structure of the statute if we look within Section 7. Section A4A talks about procedures that are made available at an agency, but the Congress did not use that specific provision at each voter registration agency. With respect to 7A6, it shows a different structure. It tied that to the transaction, and that's the language that this Court is obliged to respect. If there are no other questions, Your Honors. All right. Any other? All right. Thank you. All right. Now we're back to you, Ms. Cangellosi. I'd like to first devote rebuttal to invite any or addressing any concerns that any members of the Court might have that they haven't already expressed. Well, you finished off. I've lost my point. You finished off. I asked you something that was kind of drifting. I don't remember what it was now. And I said when you come back on rebuttal, you could respond to it. But now I don't remember what it was. So if you don't, we'd have to play the tape. Maybe I'll think of it before the main question I had I did ask, and that was just about the impact with DHS and family service, and we've covered that ground. Well, on the notice issue, their response, of course, is that the court, the district court made a finding that the notice vis-à-vis the NAACP was sufficient for Mr. Scott because it would be duplicative, and they cite the Acorn v. Miller, which was the Sixth Circuit case, which similarly found. So their argument is that the evidentiary record here would support that as being a legal holding. Do you want to respond to that? The truth of the matter is the notice, whether sent by the NAACP state conference or Mr. Scott or anybody, is not in evidence in the record. There is no notice in evidence in the record. The notice was not put in evidence at trial. It was not proven at trial. Nothing was proven at trial with respect to notice. The court decision, and I think it's document 70 or 71 with respect to notice, was on a motion to dismiss. And we filed a motion to dismiss and alleged that they didn't state a claim because the notice, that Scott had no notice. And the court there said, you know, let it get by a 12B6 motion, said they stated a claim. But still, they had to prove their notice at trial. So was that motion carried over into the trial? I mean, was there no ruling on the motion to dismiss and it was carried with the case, so to speak? It was ruled on by, it was the original judge, Judge Affalter, he ruled on it. But it just said whether they stated a claim or not. And our point is you still had to prove at trial that you sent notice. You know, that was an essential element of the case and they didn't prove it. So there's no proof that anybody sent notice at the trial. Do you think they rely on the complaint? For an essential element of the case, Your Honor, I don't think so. I mean, you always have to put, you know, your complaint alleges this, this, and this, but you have to prove it at trial. And they didn't prove it at trial, number one. So there's nothing at trial about anybody sending notice. Well, I wouldn't say they had proved it at trial by simply, if the complaint is in the record. Right. And the notice is attached to the complaint. Why isn't that the record before the district court? Because every, it's an allegation at that time, I would suggest, and every allegation that's in the complaint, you still have to prove them at trial. But they proved a document. They had a document attached to it. Right. There was a document attached. They had evidentiary support. Well, it wasn't put in evidence at trial. That's the thing I'm alleging. In the, yes, Your Honor. There's a difference. In other words, maybe you're right. There's a difference in introducing evidence at trial than just having it in the record itself. Yes, sir. I think so. You have to prove it at trial. You have to prove that the notice was given at trial and there's none. And the notice in the record was from the NAACP state conference only, and it was not from Mr. Scott. And Mr. Scott had an individual injury that was different from the injury of the group, so he had no notice even in the, even if you accept that it's okay to put it in the record, he had no notice even in the record. But my position, our position is you had to put it in evidence at trial. It's an essential element of your case. I mean, it's a little, your position is plausible for sure, but I just wonder if you have any kind of authority that 
I can certainly it's find some and supplement. Uh, it's not sufficient to establish the element. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not clear, and I mean, I read the Miller case. I mean, you can't tell from the opinion. It's not clear that they, quote, introduced it into evidence, close quote, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the notice, but there the court said that the, I don't remember who it was, the Secretary of State, whoever the state official was sufficiently put on notice by the ACORN uh, filing and the purpose of the notice was to provide an opportunity for the state official to, you know, know what the grievances are, comply with it, et cetera, et cetera. And so they said any notice that the individual plaintiffs would have had would have been duplicative uh, of that, and, and that and that was the whole. And then the rationale, at least I understood it here, was similarly the secretary was put on notice of it. And in fact, I guess there's some evidence here that the secretary did in fact, uh, Secretary Shedler, I think, did in fact move to try to remedy or cure, take ameliorative actions, et cetera. Am I incorrect? The, um, the secretary did uh, do things within the 90-day period, but we didn't put that in evidence at trial because they didn't put their notice in at trial. But yes, that, but so that wasn't put in either. But um, if we had known Mr. Scott had a claim, we could have remedied his easy in, in two days, not 90 days, like we tried to do. Otherwise, we offered Mr. Scott the opportunity to register every time we saw him prior to the case, and he never took us up on that. So his what lack of notice, <laughs> I didn't read the notice correctly. What was the notice that they gave uh, to you or that you needed to correct? It was... Um, it was a broad general letter, and it was said it was written on behalf of the Louisiana State Conference of the NAACP, and it just alleges that because of your numbers, Louisiana, we've looked at your numbers with respect to public assistance voter registration, and because your numbers have gone down through the years, we think you're not doing it right at public assistance agencies. They, they did not assert that you have to uh, send, did they assert anything there about uh, the uh, remote Registration. I think they had general language, Judge. It says you're not offering it with each application under Section 6A6 of Section 7, but it didn't say, i.e., you're not offering it remote. It just tracked the language of the statute. So it was it was general, and that's not in evidence, but we, you know, complain. If, if, if we went to file, uh, went to determine that uh, motor voter registration and, and that um, remote was not involved in it, the notice would not be good, but neither would, we wouldn't have to decide that because the merits of the case would indicate that it was not covered. The notice was broad. It just says you're not complying with Section 7 of the National Voter Registration Act because of your numbers, is what it said. It's my recollection. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, counsel. We have your arguments in brief and oral argument. We appreciate the submissions.